is there are all these things flowing by us all the time. Energy, you know, solar energy, wind energy, water energy, social energy, all of these things moving through us all the time. Catch them, store them, and use them to create even more catchments and storage systems. So this was a project I was involved in in the Bahamas. I got to teach down there a couple times. It was really fun. It's a, it's a design school that's out on a little peninsula. They couldn't put in a conventional septic system for the hundred or so students that are down there because it's, it's on coral and the, the effluent, the waste would just go straight into the ocean. A septic system wouldn't work. So they designed the system that started with a septic tank and then had these two lagoons that the, um, the slurry, let's call it something polite, the, the effluent from the septic tank would go into these two concrete lagoons that you can see there. And they filled the lagoons full of broken up coral, which is their form of kind of poor pumice or vermiculite or that kind of thing, gravel in other words, and planted all these native plants in it. And this is what it looked like right after it was planted. Then they started flushing the toilets into it. So you've got 100 people or so using toilets, flushing it into this enclosed basin. And that's what it looked like the day it was planted. That's what it looked like three months after it was planted. <laughs> so, you know, you're pumping water and nitrogen, nutrients into it, and it's got plenty of sunlight, so it's very, very happy. So there's three months after it was planted. This is three years after it was planted, okay? So this is, you know, nasty stuff being turned into something incredibly beautiful. What's really fun here is that uh, the, the funders for the school, the, the donors are like Yale trustees and very wealthy people from, from New England. They came down for a tour. And we gave them a tour of the place and they, uh, they'd walk up through the center here to this palapa and then they'd come down in the trail and we'd stop here and then we'd explain what was going on. And they, you know, and there's no smell. I mean, it's gorgeous. There are butterflies and birds in it and they're looking around going, oh, that, that's really disgusting. Oh, but it's so beautiful. But it's, oh, but that's, you know, it's, it's amazing, just this, I mean, this is stuff that's going by all the time. Catch it, use it to make something beautiful. So models, you know, who's doing horticultural societies right now? The Amazon, turns out that the, the forest composition in huge portions of the Amazon is not what you would think, looking at statistics, it doesn't have the species distribution that you would think of just a random set of species, far more food producing plants, far more nitrogen fixing plants, far more timber species in it than a random assemblage of plants would have. So the Amazon's been tweaked by people for a long time so that humans can be there and have a good time there. And yet the Amazon is one of the nicest, most functional because It's the lungs of the planet. And yet people have tweaked it. So a, a site of horticultural societies. <coughs> the uh, temperate zones, the most of the East Coast, there are stories okay, that most of the East Coast, the Mississippi Valley, the major <coughs> valleys in California, most of the low-lying areas in this country were food forests before the Europeans got here. And you know, the major species in, uh, in a lot of New England and the East Coast before Europeans got here, walnuts, chestnuts, hickory nuts, beech nuts, White oak, which is an excellent edible. The white oak is the best of the acorns to eat. It doesn't contain tannins. Uh, it make a really good meal out of it. And the people who tended that for food forest were exterminated. The food forest kind of fell apart. So when folks like Emerson and Thoreau and those guys who are writing about the, the tangled, dark, scary forest primeval, you know, in the 1800s or the wilderness, what they were looking at was a food forest that had had a couple centuries to degrade and become this kind of nasty thicket at that point. So this, this is, we can create these wonderful ecosystems where there's tons of food for us and yet, you know, the reports of naturalists in the early, early days of, you know, the birds that would take days for a flock to fly by and salmon so thick that you could walk across the river and yet people were using those lands and, and modifying them enormously horticultural societies. So some examples of horticultural societies, the Hopewell people who lived in Pennsylvania and New Jersey were there for about 4,000 years as a horticultural society. That's pretty, pretty good to be in the same place for 4,000 years. Mound builders, so they, they were mound builders. Here's a site in New Jersey uh, that's, that's one of the Hopewell mounds. These folks had great art. 
You know, they did beautiful, beautiful work, a very high culture, but they were horticultural. They grew a little bit of corn, but tended several hundred species of other plants and had great habitat there. A few more examples, the northwest coast, uh, primarily horticultural and forager people. Ancient Oaxaca, they had some corn, but they also had hundreds of species grown in polycultures in their dooryard gardens. Uh, the Nuwa'alu in, in Indonesia are a horticultural society that's been there for thousands of years. The Owens Valley Paiute and the Kumaya'e in, in California are two peoples who were there for thousands of years as gardeners. Not farmers, they weren't doing big scale crops, they were gardeners and doing some hunting, but they were there for thousands and thousands and thousands of years living sustainably. So the idea that horticulture is this short little transition period in between foraging and farming is not true. It is a stable way for human beings to reside on the planet and make a really good life and yet allow other ecosystems to function. So a couple models, I'll buzz through these very quickly. The Bullock Brothers on Orcas Island have a 25-year-old food forest that has so much food in it. When I show up there to teach, when there are 50 students up there, Doug Bullock comes to me and says, Toby, your job is to eat 10 plums a day for the next three weeks. So everybody at the whole course, 50 people eating thousands of plums, and there's still tons of food there at the end of the course. Uh, the Regenerative Design Institute in Marin County, Penny Livingston's place, uh, another example of, of a fairly well-established horticulture, permaculture site. So when I got into this stuff, permaculture, about 15 years ago, or really 20 years ago, I really thought it was, you know, I, I thought I was, it was kind of a hobby, I guess, kind of like gardening. You know, I liked it. I thought it was a cool idea. I liked systems thinking. You know, look, here's a way to do systems thinking and garden at the same time. I, you know, really, really found it very attractive. So it was kind of like a hobby. And over the years, though, I realized, I mean, this is actually a little more important than just a hobby. You know, we, we need to be doing things like this. We need these kinds of transitions, not back. We don't go backwards. We're not going to go back to foragers or back to what the type of horticulture people used to do. But we need to move into something where we understand the teachings of these horticultural societies. And we're, we're starting to make that transition, the fact that this room is full of people right now. You know, I'm some guy from the West Coast and you all showed up here, you know, with the potential of snow and all of that. It shows what the interest is. You know, it shows that there are lots of us starting to do this here. Very grateful.